John T. Edge, Bill Smith, thank you so much for joining us on UNC TV. Uh, John T., question for you right out of the gate. Okay. What is the Southern Foodways Alliance? It is an institute of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi. I direct it, Bill serves on the board, um, and we do three things. We document and study and celebrate the diverse food cultures of the American South. Simple, straightforward. We pay homage to working class cooks and tell their stories. And Bill, as a chef and native North Carolinian, uh, what is the food culture of the South? What makes Southern food Southern? Well, there's no one Southern food culture. <laughs> there's there are many, many, many. Um, I always think of it as grandmama's food when I think of my Southern uh, cuisine. And uh, I'm from Eastern North Carolina, and I use that's sort of my framework personally. But you, there's there's every part of the South has a different food culture. They're, they have over things that are the same too, but yeah. but really, I mean, Louisiana and North Carolina are real different, you know. But it's also, I mean, people try to encompass Southern food and say, what is Southern food? I mean, the South is comparable in size to Western Europe. Uh -huh. And no one asks us to say, what is European food? You understand French food and Italian food, and you understand the foods of Emilia Romana and the foods of Provence, but we don't talk about sub-regional Southern food, and we should. You know, there are many Souths, and even within a state like North Carolina, there's a great difference uh, uh -huh. between the foods on the eastern plain of the state and in the western hills and mountains of the state. I, I think there's a common thread, though, between all these southern states that harkens mm -hmm. back to grandma's food or something that you said yeah. uh, earlier, Bill. And what do you mean by that? Can you elaborate a little bit? Well, to me, that's it, I guess that's the regional food of eastern North Carolina. I grew up with um, in families where there was an aunt or a grandmother or something that cooked really well every day and that and we went to my great grandmother's house for lunch every single day we would leave school you leave work sit down at the table napkins tablecloths mind your manners the whole thing every day and everything was always delicious you know and so that's to me that's what i'm i'm talking about but everyone else would have a different context i guess but that's and I, but that's what i draw from to start with and what was what was on the table what was served generally oh well, it was never the same um i, I don't know if i can even begin to name things um it would be a full meal, though. It would be like uh, meat and three vegetables, except on Friday because we were Catholics. It would be fish and three or four vegetables, and there was always dessert, and the adults could have a drink, and you know, and uh, and like it was like a real, it was like a dinner party, but it was lunch. You know, <laughs> oh, they, they they called it dinner. Though. They, they said you're coming over for dinner, and that meant lunch. Really. And then at night you had supper. <laughs> um, so John T, there's there's this crop of folks, academic folks, some highbrow folks, let's say, mm -hmm. that are interested in, for lack of a better term, lowbrow food. I mean, some of these recipes <laughs> have Ritz crackers, nothing wrong with Ritz per se, but not what you would imagine a bunch of academic folks kind of celebrating. What do you think accounts for these two worlds colliding? Well, I think that academics have embraced food ways, which is a fancy pants term for the study of food as culture, as a cultural artifact. Mm -hmm. um, but I think academics understand that food is a totem of people and place. You know, it's, to study food is to understand this product of people and place. It's the food we cook and serve to one another, and in that act of serving, culture and beliefs are communicated. Um, so it offers academics a way of thinking about um, big subjects. You can get at those important things like race and class and gender and all that through food, but it's also a non-threatening way to get at that stuff. If you sit down and say, we're here to talk about class and race, you know, people rear back. Mm -hmm. You say, we're here to talk about food, people lean in. Some of the recipes in here, they seem, you know, like they were popular maybe 50, 75, 100 years ago. And in right. one chapter, they say it was, I think, the gravy chapter. They were for plow hands and plow hand pretenders. And right. there are still people that are plowing the fields now, but sure. the majority of folks that are going to be using this cookbook are not out in the field. Right. Is there a way to honor the past while also recognizing that our culture has slightly changed? Yeah, I mean, this is food that would have been sustenance in years past, you know, for the person that was out there plowing the back 40. And now it's more sacrament. You know, this is food that is imbued with meaning and, you know, connects those tethers to the past. To sit down with a plate of biscuits and sawmill gravy you're not a sawmill worker. Um, it doesn't. You don't have to be a sawmill worker to enjoy that. But in eating that and thinking about the story behind it, you kind of commune with the past and you learn, learn the stories of the past that connect 
those people to your present. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can you can you can eat high calorie um, plow hand food and still live in the 21st century South. Yeah, certain studies have said that 10 of the 11 most obese states are in the South. Sure, and we're celebrating Southern food, mm -hmm. and uh, there's lots of factors that account for the obesity social economic factors. What role do you think food and the food that we're celebrating specifically in this cookbook play in that sort of environment? Well, I think, you know, there is the tendency when you look at a book like this to go toward the high calorie or to go toward the stunt food, the possum. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you look at the great majority of these recipes, these are recipes that are farm driven recipes. There's probably six recipes, eight recipes for greens in there. You know, these are simple foods that are farm focused. They're not all about grease. Mm -hmm. um, having said that, you know, because I think of this food as sacrament, a little grease once a week isn't going to kill you. What is going to kill you is a fast food diet at the drive through every morning. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, and certainly I, I have no medical opinion on this and no bearing upon this, but I'm more concerned about fast food diets um, and convenience diets than I am the product of a kitchen where someone is cooking with care from a good book. And but also, a lot of this food, the South was poor most of the time, sure. and so a lot of that comes out of poverty, you having to use things because you were poor and you couldn't waste, and the cheaper things tend to be the starchier things and the fattier things a lot of times, and so it's just, that's just the way it evolved, and now we've all developed a taste for it, which is good, but, <laughs> but initially a lot of it was because they had to eat that way. Some folks that don't live in the South, even people that do live in the South, may have misconceptions about what Southern food is. Um, what age group people are kind of behind this movement, and do you feel like the younger people really know what Southern cooking is and have an appreciation for it, and how, how can they get involved? Well, I think there's a misconception in the broader marketplace about Southern food. I see a younger generation, I see kids in their 20s, who are as obsessed with, as fascinated by Southern food culture as are people in their 30s and 40s. I think there's a younger generation, um, you know, if in the 1960s, if there was a large group of folks who came south um, to study at the foot, um, study at the feet of old bluesmen and learn what they did, how they played, where they learned their songs, I think there's a whole other generation now that is taking its inspiration from food and they're coming to sit at the foot of the aged barbecue pit master or the fried chicken mm -hmm. cook. Um, and those 20-somethings think of those fried chicken cooks and barbecue pit masters. They're the ones that are hip. They're the ones they're taking their cues from. So I think this younger generation appreciates Southern food culture in a way I never did when I was in my 20s. And I think that interest will continue to grow and grow stronger and stronger. It's right. hip. It's cool. Well, great. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. And congratulations on the book. Thanks a lot. Thank you.